Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is actually our 35th Q&A show. You get to ask us questions and we hopefully give you the answers you need. If you want to get your questions in, add them in the comments below this very video, or you can fire them in to the email address on the screen there. Make sure you use that hashtag AskGMBNTech in the subject header. It just makes it real easy for us to find them and answer your questions. So first up is from Boomerang Freak. I've been looking for a wheel centering stand for a long time now. I ride with discs on most of my bikes and find it annoying to try and center a wheel on the bike, so I'd actually want to stand for it. I'm also planning on building some custom wheels at some point. Considering I have a collection of bikes that all have different hub types, being QR, road, mountain bike, through axle, etc., uh, would it be worth taking into consideration a part tool TS4 over the TS2.2 for mostly its wider compatibility, even though there's a hefty price difference? I'm quite a heavy guy and do ride around on far from perfect wheels, which I want to change. So I'm thinking about getting a fair amount of use out of it. This is really cool actually. So a wheel jig, when you buy one, is pretty much the last one you're gonna buy. So you've got to take that into account. And yeah, they are expensive. I mean, if I just look at the, uh, the catalog, a bit of bedtime reading actually, this is for me. I quite, quite often have a, a read of this. So the TS4 is their newest stand and that's actually compatible with everything up, up to and including fat bike wheels. And I think really, unless you're planning on buying a fat bike, I don't see why you would need this over the 2.2. So I've got the two, uh, the slightly older model, and we have the 2.2 here in the GMBN set. Yeah, it's kind of it's a modular system. There's additional things you can buy for it, like the dial indicator gauge set. It's a really pro setup. And of course, like Calvin showed me on last week's special ask, in combination with the spoke tension meter, there's the wheel app on the Park Tool site, which I just want to build a set of wheels now just so I can like go through that process because I've built many wheels over my life and I've never actually done it using that app to actually accurately measure the spoke tension on those. So that's something really quite interesting from my point of view. And I think if you're going to be getting a wheel jig, that's definitely a route you want to go down. Now, just taking into consideration what I said about you're spending a lot of money. So the TS4 is about 350 and I think the 2.2 is about 100 less than that um, in pounds sterling that is. So it's going to be similar in euros and US dollars. Um, quite a lot of money to spend, but you pretty much should buy it once. You don't need to buy again, like it's a really, really good piece of kit. So just consider if you're ever actually gonna have a fat bike or not, and then I think really that will make that decision for you. Uh, next up is from Bert Anderson. Ask GMBN Tech, can I upgrade from a one by 10 setup to a one by 11 or one by 12 while still using the same hub, or do I need to upgrade this hub? No, you can definitely keep your hub, but you do need to make sure that you're using the correct cassette for your hub. So just for example, the SRAM system uses a dedicated driver body that sits on the hub, known as the XD driver body. Whereas a Shimano pattern cassette uses the traditional spline fitting with a lock ring to hold it on. So you just need to make sure whichever one you pick, you pick the one that fits your existing hub. Now, depending on which hub you have on your bike, you can buy the driver body as an aftermarket product, but it's not available for every single hub. So that is something you wanna check if you did wanna go the SRAM route. Now also note SRAM's base model, the NX drivetrain, uses the Shimano pattern splined one, whereas anything upward to that, so GX and all the rest of them, they use the XD driver body. So just to know there's two different systems out there, but basically, yes, you can use your existing hub. Next up is from Daylight Sensor IMA. Can I add volume spacers um, or a MRP ramp control cartridge in a fork with Talas technology? Um, no, unfortunately you can't. Basically, Talas is a, um, a travel adjustment system from Fox, enables you to wind down the fork for climbing or other trail situations and unwind it for longer travel for descending. You can only really add the MRP cartridge, that ramp control, or the volume spaces in a float system by Fox. Uh, just basically because of the top caps. There's a couple of ways around this though. So the first one is you could change your air system in there to a float system, which is quite pricey. Or you can go for the cheaper option, which is putting some float fluid oil inside that air chamber. So with this Fox Talas fork, you need to remove the air from the air chamber, take the dial off the fork there completely, or the whole top cap assembly out. So you're looking into that air chamber. And then basically you can, you can change the air volume by adding oil into that air chamber. Now Fox float fluid comes in five cc little pouches. So it's really good for taking note of how many you put in. 
Now, if you look on the Fox website, you'll find that their volume spaces come in different sizes according to the different diameter legs. But if, for example, it's in a 34, you'll find they probably come in 5cc amounts, 5, 10, 15s. So you could add in up to three spaces worth by using three pouches of that fluid. And it has the same effect. That oil takes up the same space that the, the spacer would, reducing the air volume and making your fork feel more progressive. Just don't go too far, just like the same with air volume spaces because you get a negative effect. Basically, the fork will spike, it won't feel very nice, you won't use all of that travel. So experiment in 5cc pouches until you get the fork feeling the way you want. That's the way to do it. Slightly trickier one from Ben Cohen. I'm in the market for 150mm drop dropper post. Um, problem is I have a 272 diameter seat tube and there are not many dropper posts in the diameter and none I can find at that travel. I was wondering if you know of any 150mm travel dropper posts with 27.2. I've got a Trek Marlin 5 uh, 2018. Thanks again. Unfortunately, you are fairly limited with the 27.2 seat tube, basically, because it's quite hard to make a dropper post with all those internals inside to work really well and have correct overlap and all the other issues there are. Now, fully aware that lots of bikes still come, especially cross-country bikes, with 27.2 seat tubes, and the reason for that is to increase the flex, so it has a bit more comfort. Perfectly makes sense. However, you will be limited with those dropper posts. Now, as far as I know, the only two out there that are nearing 150 are both, so 125 and 120, the Elite seat post by Thompson, which is fairly pricey, it's absolutely beautiful by the way, it's got one of the nicest clamps on it. That comes in 27.2 with 125 mil drop, or there are the KS seat posts, and they do a couple of their LEV or LEV seat posts, also in a 27.2 with a 120 mil drop. And I think really that is about as high as you're going to get. There may be a few others that do exist on the market, but none that are on my radar at the moment. The earlier ones for now were Gravity Dropper from way back. They used to make dropper posts in 27.2, but I'm not really aware of too many others out there. Um, I hope that gets it sorted for you, but 120 is certainly better than 100. Um, not quite as much as 150 though. Sorry, dude. Next up is from Tai Tran. I'm getting a slight sound squeaking type near my bottom bracket. The bike was bought used. I've already had to get new pads and bleed the brakes. Do I need to check and grease the bottom bracket as well? Yeah, absolutely. If you bought a bike used, it's clearly been used, and even if it's been looked after, it's in your interest to give the bike a bit of a service yourself, even if it's just give it a nice clean and a lubricate everywhere, and even take some things off to grease them. So when you're thinking of any sort of creaks and groans and squeaks and squeals around your bottom bracket, there's loads of things it could be. It could be the cleat on your shoe on the pedal, it could be the pedal itself in the crank, it could be the insert for the pedal in the crank if that somehow comes loose, it has happened on some cranks. It could be the chain rings or the chain ring where it bolts onto the crank, it could be the crank onto the axle, it could be the actual bottom bracket itself, or it could be as simple as the little rubber seals on the outside of the bottom bracket being bone dry and just squeaking a bit. So yeah, whip it all off, give it a clean, give it a grease, and it gives you the good opportunity to see the condition of all of those parts, just so you know for when you're gonna to need to replace them down the line. Always good to do that, especially when buying a used bike, you should definitely just have a once over on it, check everything over the Allen key and, you know, and put some lube on it basically and check it, and hopefully your bike will be creak and squeak free. Next up is from Mr. Chris Bicoon. Um, strange name. Hello, Mr. Doddy. Recently, I've been experiencing some spokes snapping on me. I've changed the riding conditions from clay-based trails to more rocky, heavy rooted trails, and now I've been experiencing frequent spoke snapping. Why is this happening? I'm currently running a set of M70 NVs on a Santa Cruz Nomad 4. Oh, well, there you go. I think the issue may well be right there in those NV wheels. So the NV rims are incredibly stiff and it's vital that they have the correct spoke tension. If your spoke tension is too high, they're gonna be prone to snapping because there's nowhere else for that flex to go. If you think on any set of wheels, even like some of the stiffest wheels, there's gonna be flex somewhere. So you have to cater for that. So by having a slightly lower spoke tension on them, you're allowing for that flex. If you've got a high spoke tension, all it's gonna take is some really big impacts that are slightly, slightly different to the usual sort of impacts you might get when you're out on the trails, and that can snap a spoke. So I've just been on the Envy site here, and they say uh, spoke tensions for mountain bike wheels, front disc ones, 120 kilogram force, and rear 120 kilogram force as well. They say, tech note, opposite side tensions will vary based on hub selection and necessary tensions to bring the wheel into dish. 
Now it's not uncommon for mounted by wheels to be like 140 or 150. So there is a chance that your wheels, and it does sound like it, have been laced up with slightly more tension. So if you're unsure about doing this yourself, take it to your local bike shop, get them to check that for you. And then hopefully that will be the end of you snapping spokes because you've got a great set of wheels there and a great bike. So shame to hear that. So uh, I think that's all it is. Next one is from Pat. This is a bit of a throwback one, but actually this is really relevant still because it teaches you a lot of lessons. So can I ask a question here? Okay, I will. I have an e-bike with square taper crank arms, uh, Yamaha sync drive. Endless controversy, dry grease, lube, copper, um, that's copper slip, uh, press fit retaining camp compound. Um, do I need the preparation for that, the primer? Having been a bike rider for 55 years, I realized that over talking square taper is a very easy thing to do, creating a compounding problem, yep. One manual says to look out for contact points on the axle. Um, the bike is creaking like a wooden boat. I think some of it from the cranks. Your perspective, please. Yeah, all right, so I've had this problem for years. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to use square tapers on any of the bikes I ride now. Always growing up, I'd find I'd damage a left-hand crank predominantly, and it would never tighten sufficiently. Basically, the axle would be tougher than the actual crank itself, and therefore the taper would never be an accurate fit, and all you're doing is tightening up against it and it starts moving, and therefore it starts creaking, becoming loose. So the rule book says dry, but I know that there are loads of different theories on this. Some manufacturers like Royce say using a bit of copper slip on there is a good idea just to get it on there. Then you torque it up to the correct setting and it should stay in place. However, all it takes with the square taper is the tiniest bit of movement and then you're done basically. So assuming that your crank might not be damaged, so let's just say it's a brand new crank, I would say clean the whole lot put it on completely dry, torque it up to the correct torque setting, and hopefully that's the end of your problem. Um, it has been said that you can use a retaining compound, that would definitely help, but it's only gonna help if your crank does fit well in the first place. If your crank is even the slightest bit stretched or worn, it's not gonna help at all. It'll be a temporary fix, and as soon as that retaining compound, like as soon as that sort of breaks, you're gonna get the creak back. Of course, if you're using copper slip or grease or anything like that, it's gonna be easy to over torque it, create, compounding that problem basically, making it move more on there. I've heard of some people using assembly compounds like carbon gripper stuff with the floating particles in there, but I don't see that as a good thing to do, to be honest. I would stay dry, but it sounds to me that it could be a damage with your square taper crank as it is. Uh, I do hope you get that sorted out because it's unusual to hear of square tapers still being used, to be honest. That was very much a mid-90s problem for a lot of mountain bike riders. Um, so hopefully you can get that sorted out. And last up this week is from Boomerang Freak. Doddy, what's your opinion on using a compression bung like the Hope Head Doctor? Uh, on a mountain bike fork. I know these are using carbon steerers on road bikes, but would they be good in a mountain bike alloy or a steel steerer? In the end, there's not really stress put on it when riding, right? Um, I'm not too fond of star nuts, to be honest, and it seems you can get good compression bone, you can just keep swapping it between forks and bikes instead of buying new star nuts all the time. They work absolutely fine, it has to be a good one. I know the Hope one does work very well. If it doesn't actually compress enough into the inside of the steer tube to pull it up, you're never gonna get decent preload on that bearing, and it's always gonna sort of creep itself loose. Um, I have no issues with a star nut, because you chuck it into a fork, it's done then. You don't need to do anything. And every time you get a fork, you get a new one. Uh, if you buy a new headset, for example, the new bike, whatever, it's gonna come with a spare. When you buy a new fork, it comes with a star nut in there as well. Uh, that said, the Hope option is way neater and a much nicer solution, so I can definitely see your appeal. Um, if you wanna use one, go for it. I think it works great. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Let us know what you thought in the comments underneath. And don't forget to get your questions into the email address that was on the screen at the beginning of the show and in those comments with the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. For a couple more really cool videos, click up here for the special we did last week with Calvin. There's so much nerdy stuff in there about wheels. I'm still trying to get over it myself, to be honest. And click down here if you want to see everything about fitting a new fork. Part of that process, of course, is fitting a star-fangled nut, the thing we just talked about in relation to that Hope Head Doctor. As always, click on the round globe to subscribe to GMBN Tech and help us get all the way up to 100,000 subscribers. We love having you here. And if you like the show and you like the channel, give us a thumbs up.